Hello po, um, my name is Dr. Annabelle A. Gridonas and welcome to our webinar session titled Leading Change from the Classrooms, Teachers as Leaders. So it is expected that at the end of this training you would be able to explore and identify the various roles of being a teacher leader and a teacher manager. So my session would be discussing the various topics relative to leadership and management to with classroom management and positive discipline, leading from within, learning styles, teacher leadership and management, timeless elements of strong student-teacher relationships, and the priority matrix. I'm pretty sure that you're familiar with the book The Art of War by Ralph D. Sawyer, in which he shared one of Sancho's life lessons, which goes this way. If you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. If you know yourself but not the enemy, for every victory gained, you will also suffer a defeat. If you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. In this time of pandemic, I think heaps of emotions have been overcoming us these past few days. Firstly, we are thinking of our safety and survival with our family. And secondly, of course, the most special persons or people in our heart are our students. On how are we this time of pandemic? Um, I guess you are also thinking of their physiological needs, right? That is why I am always stating in my trainings that Maslow first before Bloom you know, must be the priority goal of every government so that students will be uh, able to face the stress and the anxiety that they are experiencing. And then maybe Maslow and Bloom will go along the way. Okay. Now, why am I... Um, telling you about the enemy because Gandhi has stipulated that the enemy is fear. We think it is hate, but it is fear. A majority of us may say that we do have various types of fears, right? Personally, my fear is heights. No, I don't like um, heights. It, it kills me to the bone. No? And I guess some of you will are also having fear in public speaking, in spider, cockroaches, etc. The moment you know, we react to fear, it poses us dangers, my dear teachers. Now, how fear works, no? Yun nga. When we react to fear, uh, the moment or the power of danger is coming you know, to us. Why? Because when we feel it, you know, our body has... Uh, that change where some of our system will be dysfunctional, maybe malfunctioning. The first one is um, digestive system. When we are afraid, it sometimes affects us when we're eating, in terms of eating, you know? uh, in terms of uh, catching up our breath. You know? It depends you know, on how we are going to uh, balance ourselves when it comes to facing this fear. The impact of chronic fear also includes living under constant threat, which will weaken our immune system and can cause cardiovascular damage, gastrointestinal problems such as, such as ulcers and irritable bowel syndrome and this decreased fertility. It can also lead us to uh, processing our brains that allow us to regulate emotions, read nonverbal cues and other information presented to us. Other consequences of long-term fear include fatigue, clinical depression, accelerated aging, and even premature death. Yeah. That is why if you're going to embrace fear within us in this time of crisis, it will really have a repercussion on how do we deal with our job every day as a parent, as a teacher, as a husband or wife, etc. So the best keyword for that is balance, equilibrium, in order to face the, the fear that is besetting around us. 
Now, in the course of leading in managing from within, according to Sancho, we must prepare for the fight. No? We must be able to present ourselves in, many, in a manner where the fear is not present so that we could be able to produce positive outputs, effectively uh, perform our tasks as teacher leaders and classroom managers. Now, um, part of our topic, which is quite uh, crucial now nowadays, is classroom management because we are actually transitioning from face-to-face -to, -face to online learning or flexible learning. It depends on the particular agency or school on what uh, type of flexible learning it is going to adapt, right? So I belong to a state university and college, so we are going to employ the use of flexible learning. And for the Department of Education, teachers will have also the other types of alternative modes so that the quality education could still be catered while we are in the time of crisis. So I guess we do have different definitions when it comes to classroom management because we do have different uh, experiences. It's maybe you will tell me uh, it's being prepared for the class, you are creating a safe and comfortable uh, environment for your students. Uh, it's one way to build the self-esteem of your students. It's where you present and prepare your classroom uh, learning environments, etc. No? So I could not judge you on what possible classroom learning management you do have now because, I mean, I do not know your students. It's you alone could identify how to calibrate your own classroom managing. No? So... The last resort you know, that we could describe of it is effective discipline. When we establish rules and rules and routines in the classroom, it's being one way, one pathway to become an effective teacher because uh, it's established and the students are guided as to how and and uh, when are they going to to present themselves in a manner that they are respecting and showing. Uh, interaction toward their teachers so it is different for everyone okay again um, sometimes there uh, you would observe your classroom teachers are quite um, strict when it comes to giving uh, class requirements and you are there just observing as to or maybe questioning no? the way how your colleague is performing such or doing such uh, classroom management. But you know, we can never really judge with the way how our colleagues are managing their own uh, classroom environment because we do have different uh, styles in classroom management. Okay, now, So I, I, I would say that you're aware of the attention grabbers that we normally do and present in the classroom. No, attention grabbers are used in order to uh, discipline our students, uh, tell them that we are also giving some rewards and praises, and other multidimensional functions as to how and when to use attention grabbers. You may use stop, give me five, listen, excellent. Um, in the course of online learning, we need to prepare for this. No? That's why we are preparing the pre-learning packages because it's where our students are still uh, transitioning, transitioning themselves no? from the lesson of the day. That's why teachers' uh, motivational uh, tools when it comes to enticing the attention of their students must be systematic and comprehensive. When you are in the actual face-to-face -face interaction, you may bring cardboards and any other materials in order to incorporate the way how you uh, formulate your attention grabbers. You can also seek the help of your students to do this. Well, for example, in the Facebook, you could see heaps of emojis or tools no? when you like, when you dislike, and other 
uh, emojis which could grab the attention of the users. So the big question here is why is classroom management important? Now, according to John Dewey, classroom managers are providers of quality education. There is a need to prepare, practice, and uh, present the best calibration on uh, classroom management. And it serves three functions. The first one is satisfaction and enjoyment. This should be the ultimate goal of every classroom manager, to create a fun, uh, meaningful, inspiring learning environment because students will be motivated and will be inspired to uh, join and participate in the class because the atmosphere is pleasant, right? The second one is classroom management issues. There is no perfect uh, learning milieu for our students because there are oodles of issues that also we are facing nowadays, especially we are transitioning to a flexible learning. So uh, firstly, our students will be adjusting with the use of the gadgets in uh, interacting with their teachers. That's one of the issues because some students do not have internet connection. They don't know how to, uh, to navigate themselves with the use of the learner management system that the teacher is actually using okay so there are a variety of issues that we need to address the third one is classroom management and effective instruction so through it the teacher could be able to deliver the content learning experiences pedagogies etc because uh, it's being settled at the onset the teacher is prepared you no know? the teacher is able to situate the the, the normal situation where students will be in place upon listening and sharing ideas. So the aspects of classroom management it is actually um, consists of two things. The first one is prevention and the other one is intervention. So the two are actually noted to be given due importance so that uh, problems will not be occurring afterwards. When you say prevention, that the, uh, it's what the teacher does before a problem occurs. No? So it's quite relative and relevant when it comes to classroom management because before a problem occurs, the teacher is ready, establishing his or her rules, rules uh, with the students. And the other one is intervention. So it means to say that there is a problem and so the teacher will be making some elements how to possibly uh, solve the problem. So I would say that um, prevention is better because it's where uh, the rules are already established in order to minimize the problems which shall occur no, in the classroom environment so how do we get the attention of the class so let's go back again to the attention grabbers that we normally uh, introduce in the classroom no? for an online learning it's quite difficult that's why we need to plan out we need to to strategize how to um, get the attention of our students no? is the way how we prepare with our modules our lessons our instructional pedagogies etc we need to do it one by one, okay, so that our students will be able to enjoy it and will be able to uh, identify that this type of learning experience is uh, meaningful, okay? So never forget the good things that we need to instill in them whenever they are in the pace of flexible learning. So what are your problem days, times, etc.? And what strategies do you use? So in the face-to-face -face interaction, marami yan, no? And for now, we will forget those things muna because we are about to shift no, to another dimension. And that is where we do the flexible learning. That's why we need to be prepared. I, I, I advise you need to take one course in online distance learning so that you can experience how to answer learning courses, assessments, and other tools no, needed in order to on, uh, enroll yourself in a learning milieu so that 
you can have a better perspective that your students uh, may feel during the course of a learning environment through online learning. So along the way, there would be some uh, problems. That is why uh, the course of being a teacher leader and teacher manager must be our top priority. So, so when we say student engagement, it's where the students are involved in the learning experience inside the school or maybe outside the school, right? So it could vary or it could vary into three dimensions. The first one is cognitive, behavioral, and emotional. When we say cognitive, it's the learning investment of the child. Behavioral, it's where the child is involved when it comes to academics, non-curricular activities, and other things that he or she uh, does in the school. And the last one is the emotional. It's where the positive and the negative reactions that the students or learners are feeling when they are engaging with their teachers, peers, uh, school administrators, parents, and etc. So, um, it's coming already, and we could never deny the fact that this will be our new normal, the cycle of online instruction. Okay, um, I guess you have various problems because uh, ako, personally, I do have problem when it comes to internet connection. That's why um, sometimes I do recording in order to not disrupt a certain talk or maybe a certain classroom presentation because internet connection is not really good in our country. That's the fact, actually. Okay, so... The cycle of online instruction could be summarized into four. This answers the whys, the how what's, the hows, and the what ifs. Okay? And when we are talking about uh, Bloom's taxonomy, learning in action, we are considering the lots and the hots, where these two are actually inseparable in order that the, the experiences no, needed by the child to become effective and holistic learners will be best achieved. In the course of e-learning, we should never forget you know, the, the role of Bloom's taxonomy of learning. Now, there's are also we are also considering the six factors of classroom proficiency. You know? The first one is instructional design. I guess we are not actually experts when it comes to ICT and, and making and or crafting or presenting an instructional design is quite fiddly sometimes. And so, um, preparation is the key. We need to be able to cater the needs of our students no, by, by being ready. You know? One of the things is to attend webinars and attend online courses so that when we start our preparation for the learning management system, you know, it's not difficult for us to navigate. The next one is accuracy and alignment. So doc, this talks about the learning competencies and standards which are needed for us to design in our classroom proficiency. The data quality on how our uh, inputs, lessons, learning content, our instructional pedagogies and assessments are indicated and presented in our learning material. The whole literacy, so we're considering the four macro skills of our students when it comes to listening, writing, speaking, and reading. So this talks on how we are, uh, they, how they are able to flexibly adapt you know, to the different assessments provided by the teacher. Student motivation, so it could be extrinsic, extrinsic or intrinsic, where students will be given the chance to. Uh, to, to get the drive you know, to do their share, to go for the best uh, learning experiences that they desire so that they can achieve such learning competencies at the end of the lesson. And the last one is the depth of knowledge. Okay, so the future employers of our students are actually, are actually considering their uh, white background background knowledge when it comes to theories. That's why teachers should never forget that learning content is still one of the best ways to 
to be given priority. Okay? Now, the cycle of instruction is catered into four uh, dimensions. The first one is imaginative learning, which focuses on the key question, the why. It means to say that our students are uh, really would like to involve practical applications in the classroom. Okay, So, in the course of online learning, it's the job of the teachers to find suitable learning experiences which will answer and cater students' ability to uh, present and experience authentic real-life problems. Okay, I, I guess some of our materials are taken from the open educational resources, commons, and other important resources that we are uh, actually getting from the internet, but we sure to always inject uh, real ground problems so that our students' abilities to answer the whys you know, will, be based, will be best facilitated. Okay. The next one is analytic learning. You know? So this focuses on the concepts, the theories, the principles which our students need to acquire at the end of the lesson. Okay. So we, we present the content. And it depends on us on how are we going to budget the time so that at the end of the lesson, the students would be able to, to acquire a basket of learning. Okay, So we present different simulations, games, online assessments for them to be able to practice analytical learning or being analytical. The next one is the common sense learning. Okay? It's the house where students could be able to exercise their dynamic role being a, a student who can who can demystify the various and the vague questions no which need a solution however the teacher facilitation is still very important so whenever we are still or even if we are targeting that they at the end of the lesson they will have that uh, they will become empowered learners, but teachers need to also guide the students so that the possible uh, learning competency must be acquired. Okay. The next one is dynamic learning. Uh, it answers the question if, where students are given the chance to experience the trial and error learning. So teachers are giving some simulations, games, online assessments, and other uh, strategies in order for the students to uh, cater and present and answer the various challenges presented by the teacher. This is actually uh, related to what Edward Thorndike has been introducing to, to us about the law of exercise so that at the end of the lesson, the students would be able to master the standard you know, presented by the certain agency we are actually employed at. We also have the done and done learning styles model, which is also a chance for the teacher to identify the preferences of the students, which could range from psychological, physiological, uh, emotional, sociological, etc. No? So accordingly, done and done is one of the best tools or learning inventories for the teachers to adapt so that he or she may uh, be able to identify the learning preferences of his or her students. Okay. Now, I hope um, you will also be able to embrace Karen Zanyan model, where teachers will be able to identify the three ways on how to uh, explain how learners are exhibiting the processing of learning you know, inside the classroom. This could range from cognitive personality style, information pro uh, processing style, and instructional preferences. Okay. We also have left brain dominated versus right brain dominated. So when we say left brain, it means to say that uh, learners are objective and the right brainers are considered to be subjective. So you can see the two uh, descriptions of this learning style. When you say left brain, students are analytical, detail-oriented, 
they're good in sequ sequencing orders. They're rational thought, verbal, cautious, planning, good, they're good in planning, math, science, logic, rightful vision, and right side motor skills. When we say right brain dominated, it means to say that the learners are intuitive thought, holistic perception, random sequencing, emotional thought, nonverbal, adventurous, impulse, creative, imagination, uh, left field vision, left side motor skills. So knowing this type of learning style no, or learning styles, it's easy for us to be able to adjust. It's, if, it, it's easy to, for us to be able to devise learning simulations, games, and learn other learning experiences for our students to perform in, in the classroom. Okay. The next one is McCarthy's format system, which is actually composed of four circular quadrants, which caters the do, feel, watch, think of our students. So this involves the cognitive, the affective, and the psychomotor skills of our students. And from that, teachers would be able to cater their learning preferences. So what teaching methods and activities suit different learning styles? My dear teachers, we are going to have a short game today and may I request every one of you to please prepare your pen and paper. Okay, are you ready? Okay, so we're going to begin our game, okay? So this game is called Your Personal Memory Profile. So in this activity, you will be able to learn about your own memory profile by completing different exercises and then planning your scores to understand your own personal strengths and weaknesses. So at the end of the activity, you will be able to fill in a chart that will show where your strengths and weaknesses lie. So greater awareness of your worker areas can lead you to try out different methods to find strategies that suit you personally. So the areas of assessment that I will be evaluating will be the short term, long term, verbal, visual, and the memory for facts. Okay, so we're going to delve and measure where are your weaknesses in terms of these areas of assessment. Are you ready, my dear teachers? So a count of 1 to 15, no picture taking. I want you to memorize these numbers, okay? So be mindful that you are not to write this one. Just memorize in a count of 1 to 15. Ready? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Okay, my dear teachers, it's time for you to write all the numbers that you can recall huh, from the activity that we have in a count of 1 to 15. Ready? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Stop. Okay, so for now, we'll check your work. Please check your work now, my dear teachers, and let's see if you're able to get the numbers needed for you to be able to measure your short-term memory profile. Okay, so let's try to evaluate your work. So, my dear participants, your score is how many numbers you were able to recall in one go. So, less than 5, it means you are poor. 5 to 9, average. In more than 9, you are good. So, how are you performing, my dear teachers? You're able to get an excellent job. Okay. So, that's all for the first game. The next one is for the short-term memory still. I have here a series of words for you to memorize in a count of 1 to 15. No picture taking, please. So you're going to memorize this in a count of 1 to 15. Ready? Go! 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 
9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Okay, my dear participants, you're going now to write all the words that you can recall when it comes to short-term memory. Okay, so you're going to start the counting again and write your words. Ready? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Okay, time is up. So let me show you again the words for you to correct. Okay, see for yourself, my dear teachers. Please check your work now. So for now, um, I would like to give to you your score less than five. It means that they say that you are poor. Five to nine means that you are average. And more than nine, it means you are good. So what's your score? Did you pass? Okay, next. So again, you are likely to have remembered between five and nine items, right? So did you notice any pattern in the words? So if not, look again. You know? If you're going to look closely, okay, the, the, the words are actually divided into four categories. The first one is toys, furniture, clothing, and what else? Transport. So one of the easiest ways of improving memory is to group items together in categories. So this reduces the memory load, making remembering easier. Okay. So another game. I have here a series of pictures that you would you need to memorize as far as what you can recall. I will be counting once again, 1 to 15, for you to write or maybe recall first. Just recall, memorize the 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 things that you see in this picture, okay? In a count of 1 to 15, go! 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Okay, so um, I guess you're ready now to write your answer. So we, I, we'll count now. 1, 2, Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Okay, so you have now already the words, no? And for now, as a sort of evaluation, I am giving you now the questions. So you can interchange or you can maybe match the ones you have written in there from this series of questions that we have now. Okay, so I'm going to count 1 to 15 to mem for you to memorize these questions. Okay, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Stop. Okay, so I have here again the word, uh, the picture for you to match the words that you have written. Okay, so if you have answers already, so you may try to match it correctly and appropriately in a count of one to ten. Ready? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 9, 10. Again, I will be giving you, once again, the questions for you to write in a count of 1 to 15 and answer. You know, answer uh, the questions right away. So, in a count of 1 to 15. Ready? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Okay, stop. So, for now, we are going to answer the question. So, this is the picture, right? So, my dear teachers, how many people were in the queue for the bus? So, uh, let's count. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay. The next question. Sorry for that. The next question is,
So the first question is how many people were in the queue for the bus? So let's count one, two, three, four, five, six. So this is the answer. The answer is six. Next question. Um, what was the man with the bow tie carrying? Okay, let's try to check. The man with the bow tie carrying. So he's carrying umbrella. The next question. What color was the sports car? Okay, so let's try to check our answer. Uh, sports car. It's color blue or violet, right? What was advertised on the bus? It's circus, this one. Okay, the next one. What was the third shop from the left selling? So one, two, three. So tools, equipment, or hardware. The next one is, sorry. Why had the traffic stopped? So it's a pedestrian lane, right? That's why it stopped. What was the last person in the bus queue holding? Newspaper, okay? The next one, how many shops were there? So we have four shops, one, two, three, four. What was directly behind the bus? So it's a bicycle. What was the weather like? So it's sunny here, the answer. It was, was the shop on the right selling, so burgers, cakes, etc. Okay, so let me, let's, let us check your work and let me give you your score for this activity. Less than five, poor, six to nine average, and more than nine, it means good. Okay, so let's try to check your work. So what's your score, my dear teachers? Is it good, average, or poor? Okay, so see, uh, did you really improve in this activity? No, so repeating the task and seeing if you can improve on your original score. So if you do the test for the third time, you may find that you improve even more. So if you're going to do this type of law of exercise, which is anchored on uh, Van Dyke's principle or theory, there is a possibility that you can really enhance your ability when it comes to recalling. Okay, my dear teachers, this is the last activity for you to do. Um, I'll be reading it, and you're, I will be counting again for you to identify the words. Okay, later. So, Cardo Dalise was on his way to the local shop to buy a newspaper a cartoon of eggs and some jam for his breakfast. On his way home, as he was walking along the footpath, he saw a lady trip over a paving stone, stone and fall to the ground, hitting her head. He ran over to see if she needed help and saw that she had blood coming out of a wound in her head. He ran to the nearest house, knocked on the door, told the woman, who answered what had happened and asked her to telephone for help. After 15 minutes, an ambulance arrived and took the injured woman to hospital. My dear teachers, I'll be counting once again for 15 uh, seconds no, to write the words that you can recall. Ready? Go. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So I guess by now you have already written the words that you can recall from this short-term memory. And to show your score, get it? Here it is. Um, less than 15, it means you are poor. 16 to 25, it means you are average. And more than 25, it means you are good. Okay, so question, what's your score? My dear participants, did you improve? So to sum up, most people will remember the gist of the story in some detail, but it is very hard to remember such a story word for word. Our memories are not like recordings, and they don't need to be. When we are reading books and newspapers, 
most of us tend to remember the gist rather than the precise wording. So this is because although the words are important, our memory span is limited. So words become a route for a story and hence we remember only the gist. So luckily, what is important is what the words convey and not necessarily the words themselves. So I hope you have learned something from this so that you will be able to adjust no? and be agile from the varied learning experiences that you would like your students to experience uh, as you're about to transition to the flexible learning. No? That's why one of the learning styles which is also famous for us is the multiple intelligences by Howard Carter. So why, why am I uh, presenting all the learning uh, profiles and styles? Because we can also use this tools for us to be able to calibrate ourselves to become effective leaders and managers. So, okay, so let us first deconstruct what the meaning of leadership is before going to management. So there are actually many definitions of leadership, but they mostly boil down into this one. It is inspiring people to move toward a shared vision. Uh, this has been corroborated by Peter Drucker, a famous leadership author of learning. Okay, so when we are leading, we inspire people, you know, so that at the end of the day, the particular vision that is needed to be shared in the workplace must be catered and facilitated. You no, know? it's like with the father of Thor, who is also a leader of certain. Uh, community where he decided to give up his eye in order to um, forecast what is what is about to happen to his people and his community so he, he sacrificed his eye in order to see the sense and impression of the world he is leading okay so management on the other hand has various definitions okay so it boils down to planning, organizing, controlling activities and resources to achieve objectives. Um, we are part in doing this every day as we are uh, doing our management, classroom management routines, and it's somehow very effective, no? When we are considering the the key the key role of being always prepared in our class. Okay. So managers count value. They, they create uh, circles of power. They manage work. Okay. Well, leaders create circles of influence and they lead people. They lead people so that they could possibly get the, the, the best uh, So why am I saying or presenting to you the various types of learning styles, okay? So those styles are not only applicable for our learners, okay? On top of it, it's also applicable to us as teacher leaders and teacher managers because it's for that uh, thing that we will be able to uh, adjust and be flexible as to what uh, learning uh, preparations are we going to exhibit so that we can have an effective performance in the workplace okay so when we say leadership there are actually many definitions about it but it boils down into inspiring people to move forward uh, toward a shared vision okay so when we are talking about vision uh, a leader sets goals or organizational goals in order to attain no, at the end of the expected uh, schedule okay it's like it's the same with the father of thor in the movie thor where his father sacrificed his eye in order to forecast what is to happen in his community 
No? So it's about sacrifice so that you can have the shared vision that you would like to achieve no? in your community. Okay? Peter Drucker has always been encouraging our, all leader, leaders no? to be considering the goals and the mindset that should be prepared so that uh, people will be empowered to move up to the ladder of success that this organization needs to thrive. We also have management, and there are many definitions of management, and they mostly boil down to planning, organizing, and controlling activities and resources to achieve objectives. So now, as we navigate ourselves to online learning, so we do have different strategies how to cope up with this uh, new challenge. You know? <coughs> so, excuse me. So we enroll ourselves to online learning. We attend webinars and training so that we, it can capacitate us to become effective and better teachers. We plan out, we design our learning content, etc. So these are just the sum of the things that the managers do in the classroom. Okay? So if you're going to ask me whether managers and leaders are the same, well, ultimately the managers manage work while the leaders create circles of influence and lead people. This is based on Harvard Business Review. Now, let me explain it one by one you know, as regards to the different uh, characteristics, you know, whether the two are actually complementary. Okay. So when it comes to role, leadership is visionary, strategic thinker. You're looking at the long-term objective of what is going to happen to your organization. So when you say management, you know, you are an enterprise builder and you are a productivity expert which is expected no perform the basic tasks which are needed in order to make uh, to make this organization thrive okay the focus when it comes to leadership is purpose setting direction whereas management goes for nurturing organizational structure Establishing systems and processes, so this would cater from the human resource management, logistics, operations, etc. Okay. When it comes to approach, the leader has uh, the chance to create a mission statement and it's the job of management to deliver it. Okay. When it comes to methodology, leadership evaluates trends, needs, and marketplace while management oversees and organizes teams, plans, budgets, sets timelines, and maintain quality, okay? The style tone, uh, leadership inspire people and foster commitment while uh, management develop talent and solve problems. It's more on the nitty gritty things that the manager does no, in a certain organization. And when it comes to the outcome, Leadership uh, is envisioning to reach a long-range goals and objectives while management caters uh, projects effectively and efficiently. Okay, so these are the difference of leadership and management. So it, uh, what is better or which is better? It is, is it leading or managing? So may I tell you this that the two are actually complementary. They're equally valuable to making the organization thrive in this time of crisis or whether you are not on the verge of crisis. Because I still believe that um, the things that we experience are not always chaotic. We also experience ethereal life type of uh, learning situations in experiences no, in the workplace but you cannot move up unless who or what you manage moves up to okay so you have observed that your leaders are getting some accomplishments and rewards 
But you know me, I tell you, my dear leaders, that you should not uh, forget no, your followers because they are actually the ones who uh, making who make you in, in the top, no, for you to be able to get the success of the organization that you are thriving. Uh, it's because of the followers or the managers you have in the workplace. So in the pipeline, as managers, we perform various roles. We could be the managers of ourselves, the managers of others, managers of managers, the managers of functions, managers of business, managers of enterprise. We do a multi-dimensional roles of being a manager. Okay, so let us have a short brainstorm. No? Identify 10 specific examples of leadership challenges that you have encountered okay? as a teacher, as a school head. Okay? And why do you consider these challenges? My dear teachers, please try to write your, um, your output in our comment section below. No? Uh, we'll try to trace no, on what particular type of leadership challenge have been uh, really distracting no, the teachers nowadays. Okay, so I will be giving you two minutes to do this. Thank you, Paul. So I guess you have now the 10 specific examples of leadership challenges that you have encountered. So for now, I would like you to write in your comment section now uh, for us to be able to identify and explore these particular challenges because it is actually um, important for us to deconstruct this and discover and from that we'll be able to enhance and learn best practices how to solve these challenges okay so how leaders get extraordinary things done in organizations how leaders turn challenging opportunities into remarkable ones it's just a matter of being able to tap you know, to tap great people who shall be with you, you know, to cater and solve the problems in the organization that you are serving. So the qualities admired by our constituents in order to thrive the organization, okay? This consists honesty. The first one is uh, being honest, which answers the question, is that person truthful? Are you ethical? Are you principled? Do you have high integrity? My dear teachers, do you have that particular character? Okay. The next one is competency or being competent. Now, to enlist in another's cause, we must believe that they know what they are doing. So when we, take, when we say competency, uh, the teacher is able to acquire the knowledge, skills, and attitudes that he or she needs to execute you know, upon the work that he is performing. You know? And in the classroom management or in the classroom leadership that we're doing, well, we are get used to this you know, and how to lead our students but if given the chance to be given a task or responsibility or position in the workplace we need to capacitate ourselves as leaders the next one is forward looking what will the company look like feel like be like when it arrives at this goal in six months 60 years and etc okay so you should have a mindset you, know? you should see to it that in five years this would be the the current situation of my organization of my leadership in 10 years i would be able to produce holistic learners for learners who are uh, considered to be successful engineers teachers etc you know? so you are always looking for a long-term uh, okay so the next one is inspiring if a leader displays no passion for a cause why should others? Okay? So how do you get to exercise this as a teacher, leader? 
So we do have our own story so, to tell you know, as a teacher. So our own story could be one of the best tools to inspire people, to lead them the way. Okay? So you two could do this in your own classroom um, management by inspiring our students to become effective, effective and better people in this community or country. Now, there, according to research by Kozis and Posner, there are five practices of exemplary leadership. Okay? The first one is model the way. It's where uh, the leader is setting as an example you know, to behave in ways consistent to shared values of a certain uh, organization. Achieve small wins, build commitment to action. So everything you do, uh, they're actually, I mean, your followers are just observing. So be sure you're behaving in a way that you are setting the best example. We are the alpha in the classroom, for example. So we, we need to, to promote diversity, respect, and compassion so that our students will also model the way how we treat other people. The next one is others to act, you know, enable others to act, where the, the principle of collaboration has been given an utmost importance. You know? It promotes cooperative goals and mutual trust. Strengthen others by sharing power, provide choice, develop competence, and offer visible support. I've been in experience where my boss empowers us. So it's a great deal when our supervisors are giving us the chance to, to fly, to do our decisions you know, with their guidance, of course. But, you know, when we are given the chance to, to lead and manage our respective uh, tasks and responsibilities, then we can also uh, do our own thing, right? So in a certain organization, it, it is never complete when you, you can foster loyalty 100%. That's why you have the in-group and the out-group. So when you say in-group, these are the people that you trust, who believe in you, uh, who, who can easily talk to you. However, there are also people who doesn't like you and they try to be isolated and maybe they just don't feel no, to be participating. Meron talaga niyan, di ba, my dear teacher? So, how do you deal with this type of challenge? How do you cater to this type of people? How do you interact? How do you share? Are you going to be flexible and open so that you can, you can uh, reach out to this type of out-group people? So recognize, the next one is encourage the heart. You know? Recognize contributions to success, link rewards with performance. Um, in public schools, we are quite lucky because we do have various types of uh, rewards in terms of monetary and any other types of rewards. Um, I hope from the private school, if you are a leader or a teacher, um, the, the, the spirit of giving rewards would also be given an utmost consideration. It's where we celebrate accomplishments and value victories. The next one is inspire. Okay? Inspiring to have a shared vision. Envision the future. Imagine uplifting and ennobling ends. Enlist others. Attract people to a shared vision by appealing to their values, interests, hopes, and dreams. And this could be anchored on the vision and mission statement of every learning organization. The next one is challenge the process. Search for opportunities, confront and change the status quo. Experiment and take risks. Learn from both mistakes and successes. So uh, along the way, it's not the better process when we lead and manage people in our students. So we need to experiment and take risks, okay? And learn from them. And never maybe uh, apply the same mistake in the future, okay? It will, it will build a strong and effective leadership and management because you are considering the past mistakes that you have done and accumulated. 
So is teacher leadership um, valid for us? I mean, is it difficult for us to thrive in this time of pandemic? Okay, this will be the rules for all of us to function, okay, as teachers of the 21st century. The first one is being a learner, okay? So we innovate so that we can be possessing highly technical skills that this Education 4.0 is uh, requiring us so that our students can match the Industry 4.0 is needing, you know? So we need to, to sophisticate our knowledge, skills, and attitudes for, for us to be able to collaborate effectively, to connect efficiently in this time of pandemic. The next one is curricularist. You know? We design the learning content. We are part of the learning collaborations, which are, un, which are actually about to unfold nowadays. So the assessment tools that we learn, instructional pedagogies, the learning content that we're about to deliver, the standards, and other th notable things no, that we need to exhibit for being a curricularist no, must be maintained and well designed. The next one is instructional specialist. So we try to collaborate from our colleagues in order to share one specific um, way how can we uh, cater differentiated instruction, for example, or contextualization? So it's where we, we share our resources. You know? When you discover a certain strategic intervention material, so it's where you share this one so that you can have a better and effective uh, learning organization. We are a resource provider, so all the things that we share you know, to our students must be carefully planned and prepared. And we are the catalysts of change. We are not always uh, adapting you know, to the old school that we are used to do. But most importantly is we are seeking for the new knowledge and innovations no, that we need to embrace so that at the end of the day, we can uh, share this one to our learners. Okay? So let me share to you some strategies that stick for creating a pleasant, happy, and productive online learning environment. So the first one is meet and greet. So for example, you'll be using online. So I've been telling you about the module overview that you need to share so that your students will have uh, a certain identification what to do. But be sure you are meeting and greeting them. You can use a Zoom, but for me, you do not need to do a lecture in Zoom because it has a time uh, restrictions, right? So maybe you can have some kamustahan muna. In the first meeting, okay, you, you may ask some questions on how they are coping with the recent pandemic. Okay. So you need to, as a matter of fact, one of the best ways is for you to memorize their names. Okay. That's one of the strategies I normally do in the classroom during the first day. The next one is strategy, strategy number two, the do now. So it's where you let them perform something or do something so that uh, their activation of their prior knowledge has been uh, activated, okay? Or you may do some rules and guidelines, some orientation for them to be able to uh, do in your class or in your course. The rituals and routines and reteach plan that you are about to do, okay? So we are aware of the normal rituals and routines no, in the classroom, but in the course of uh, online learning, so you can provide some netiquette uh, that they need to uh, maintain and establish and observe while you are or they are in the online 
mode of delivery. Strategy number four, work the platforms. It's where you monitor the performance of your students by putting up a discussion forum or discussion board. So when you're using Schoology, there is a platform where a teacher may use it to, to have a sharing, group sharing within the, with the students. So strategy number five is avoid bias. So teachers must always inculcate no, the principle of being, uh, I mean, of avoiding prejudices in the classroom. You should uh, maintain courtesy and respect so their students will not feel uh, that my teacher has favoritism, uh, the teach my teacher doesn't like me, and all this type of negative reactions that your students might feel in your classroom environment. Strategy, strategy number six, monitor and talk. So I encourage you to do or have your discussion forum uh, dashboard, in your dashboard, because it's where you, mo you can ask their, their ideas on a particular lesson, you can let them ask something if they have confusion on the recent lecture that you have presented or the current assessment that you have just uh, let them do, okay? Strategy number seven, mean business. So I'm talking about the deadlines that you're about to give to them. Uh, be sure when you say that today is the deadline, so be sure, be sure you're not... Um, changing your minds and do another or maybe create another uh, schedule for that because because students are really observable when you do uh, changing your rules and schedules okay so sometimes they become uh, they're always thinking that I, I can do this next time because my teacher is considerate okay Strategy number eight is to advocate. So you model your way. Uh, le let your students apply all the necessary critical thinking skills that they need to, to experience in the classroom. So you need to provide them the, the best learning ex uh, experiences as well. So we also have motivation. No, the extrinsic and the intrinsic motivation. I guess you are familiar with this one. And you have, uh, in the course of our duty, we are always motivated because we are given the chance to, to experience different types of motivational tools so that we can be productive in the workplace. Okay? So I also have here the types of students which uh, based on research are diversified. We do have older, younger. We also have adversarial students who are posing uh, problems in the classroom. No? So uh, I guess you can relate with me. And you have some tools on how to cater to this type of students. We also have missionary, the veterans, Competitive, tech savvy, in which for now um, we should be prepared because when during the course of online learning, baka mas advanced pa yung students natin kesa sa yung sa atin. So we all based on research, we also have the types of students. We have older, younger, adversarial, the missionary, the veterans. Competitive, tech savvy, eager, and lost. So, these are just some of the types of students that we will be um, meeting come August because I think some of them are anxious and stressed because of the recent crisis that we are experiencing. So, how do you deal with these types of students? To what extent will you be exercising your patience you know, in answering and tending their questions and inquiries in your online classroom. So we also have types of teachers from the student's point of view. Okay, So the first one is the steady droner. This is a teacher 
who is always prepared in coming to class. Okay? All, he's a teacher who is organized when it comes to presenting the lesson. He is inspired in simulating uh, activities in the classroom. Uh, he has a variety of games to be uh, prepared in the class. So, do you sometimes experience this type of attribute, my dear teacher? The disdainful. So, this type of teacher is merciless, vindictive. Okay? So, I hope you will not apply this one in the course of online learning because now uh, we need to be kind since our students are experiencing various types of emotions in reacting to the recent pandemic okay, that is visiting us. The next one is the mighty famous Big Shot. Uh, this type of a teacher is exciting, impressive because he has a lot of information to share you know, with the students. The beloved babbling Grandpa, an old-fashioned teacher, but uh, he's a, he has a lot of things to share, ranging from the old school to that of the modern school that he is uh, experiencing. That's beloved, a bubbling grandpa. The genius from another dimension. The teacher who always uh, presents omniscient things. No, he is said to be a researcher. He knows everything. When a teacher or when a student asks, he easily answers the question because he is an intelligent person. Okay. The gloom and doom. This type of a teacher talks about creepy stuff in the classroom. So sometimes uh, students may feel uh, strange feelings whenever they uh, collaborate and connect with this type of a teacher. The single theory to explain everything uh, where the teacher has a multitude types of theory to, to share to the students and students will turn into believers. Uh, do you sometimes do that, my dear teachers? When you explain your uh, theories in the classroom and your students will become, uh, I mean, they will, they will be really amazed with how you presented your, your beliefs and and things no, relative to the discussion that you have presented. The incomprehensible, very brilliant foreigner. So it is a teacher who is sophisticated when it comes to presenting his ideas with the use of the gadgets, with the use of other tools and equipment in order to reinforce the type of learning he is delivering. And the nice little nobody, a teacher who seems to not exist at all. Yeah. So I hope we will not be experiencing this type of treatment no, from our students. That's why we need to be innovating every day so that they will feel secure and inspired whenever we start our work. So we do have here the current working generations. It could cater from the matures or the veterans or traditionalists from the 1900 to 1945. The baby boomers, which uh, sprung from 1946 to 1964, Generation X, X 1965. So we also have the current working generations, the matures or veterans or traditionalists from 1900 to 1945, the baby boomers from 1946 to 1964, Generation X, 1965 to 1980, Millennials or Generation Y from 1981 to 2000, the Generation Z, which started from 2001. So let's try to uh, explain now who are veterans or traditionalist people. So, they are also known as the greatest generation. Why? Because as you can see, if you're going to trace the events, uh, it's where the Great Depression existed, the New Deal, the World War II, World War II, Korean War. See, can you, can you imagine your life during this time of being a veteran? Uh, faith in institutions that are loyal and patriotic. 
save for a rainy day because rainy day waste not want not and influential people through this are Ella Fitzgerald, Charles Lindbergh and Franklin Delano Roosevelt. The next one is the Barons So we also have the veterans. So we also have the current working generations, the matures or veterans or traditionalists from 1900 to 1945, the baby boomers from 1946 to 1964, Generation X from 1965 to 1980, Millennials or Generation Y from 1981 to 2000, and Generation Z from 2000. Okay, so let us first uh, discuss veterans or traditionalists from 1900 to 1945. It is also known as the greatest generation. Why? Can you see the defining events are Great Depression, where there is uh, hardships when it comes to social economic status of the people, the New Deal, World War II, Korean War. Most of the people here are loyal and patriotic. They are always saving for money. There are um, influential people present to this are Ella Fitzgerald, Charles Lenberg, and Franklin Roosevelt, who is the President of the United States of America. The next one is the Veterans Or. Uh, I mean, these are the famous people uh, during the Veterans Or traditionalists. Baby Boomers from 1946 to 1964, defining events, television, women's and human's rights, and some a majority of these people are optimistic, competitive, prosperous. Um, they seek for opportunities their parents didn't have. And uh, influential people here are Martin Luther King Jr., John F. Kennedy, and Richard Nixon, Beaver Cleaver. So these are just some of the famous celebrities and uh, personalities during the baby boomers generation. So Generation Sixers born 1965 to 1980, so defining events, Challenger Explosion, the fall of Berlin Wall, the fall of Soviet Union, personal computer, and other media. Um, the skepticism also have institutions called into question. U.S. divorce rate tripled, and world is not safe anymore because the AIDS uh, was discovered. We also have drunk divers, drugs, and the proliferation of drugs, and etc. Uh, the leading people, you know, we have Clinton, of course, Monica Lewinsky, O.J. Simpson, supermodels, Michael Jordan, Dilbert. Okay, so these are some of the famous people we see during the Generation X. We also have the Millennials who are born 1981 to 1999, also known as Eco Boom. Generation Y and Baby Boxers. Okay, the defining event events are Oklahoma City bombing, Columbine High School massacre, massacre, death of Princess Diana, Lewinsky's scandal in the internet. So the people here are realistic, optimistic yet cautious, and they do respect multiculturalism. Personal safety is a workplace concern and appreciate diversity. Some of the famous people here are Barney, Backstreet Boys, Venus, Serena Williams, Tinky, Winky. So. And the Generation Z from 2001 to 2015. And you can see there, these people are being influencers, adopters, digital natives who would like to explore around the world and some of your students are really exploring this and the best way for us to deal with this type of generation is also to explore and enhance ourselves as teachers okay so we also have gen z uh, we can consider gen z as activists nowadays no they want to have people power sometimes in power 
Or should I stay because they want to exercise their rights, no? We have the proper education, the right to survival and safety. So how do you deal with this type of working generations nowadays? Now, in the course of uh, classroom management, sometimes you feel this, right? You are boring your students, and then what do you usually do? So that they will feel, um, they will still in living with the, with the course lecture that you do for that particular day. day. So you need to have that energy needs to be all, uh, having all the time. It should be high all the time. So the passion you know, should be there, but your dedication to possibly look for some uh, variations you know, for your lecture to become inspiring and fun-filled, so your students will be motivated to listen. You are living, and it is, this is quite, um, I mean it depends because some people are born with talents when it comes to humor or giving jokes no, inside the classroom but it could be learned you can have other alternatives on how to entice your students so that they will not be bored in the classroom so what are students expecting okay so they want a teacher who is not an indoctrinator okay uh, they don't want, they, they, they don't care for our politics, nor they want to be preached at. So please try to stay from the negative vibe that you have, that you want to be carried by your students, okay? They want to enjoy the learning environment that they would like to experience. Who treats them with respect, you know? who always consider uh, courtesy and acceptance in the class. As teachers, it's your job to always know their name, to always project the best in attention that you can uh, give to them so that they may experience a worthwhile classroom management experience. Who is not bully, who don't like parroting in the classroom, uh, bullying is rampant nowadays and do not consider yourself to be yourself to be the, the alpha you know, when it comes to bullying students who cares if they pass or fail so we are doing this i guess you are doing this and some of you even are visiting the houses of the students in order to educate the parents and uh, to tell the students that you are really caring for them okay so what's your experience okay in your own classroom so if we are in the face-to-face -face interaction uh, it's a fact that we need a helper. We need our students to, to assist us uh, along the way when we perform our job. So what jobs can you have for your students? Much of that will be determined by your room, school, and students. So in the face-to-face -face interaction, you can let uh, you can request your student to perform some jobs you know, so that you can be assisted. The first one is messengers, where students are uh, selected no, to assist you when it comes to uh, delivering a material to another location, teacher assistants who can assist you whenever you need an errand to be delivered or gather materials inside the classroom, the line leader and line ender who sees to it that um, all of the students are able to cater and get the correct uh, criteria or information that the teacher is giving you know, for the entire class. The next one is door holder. When someone comes in, like a visitor, uh, someone will do it you know, for the teacher. Census Bureau is someone who is checking the attendance of the entire class. And the next one is refuse collector, uh, student or students who are in charge for the garbage collection librarian who shall be fixing the magazines and newspapers and other books or other resources in the classroom culture culturalist uh, this will be in charge for the <clears throat> for the watering of the uh, the plants inside the classroom ectiologist this will be in charge for the uh, for the fish which are needed to be fed off you know? 
The next one is board management uh, in charge for the maybe you let that, that person or that student copy on the board or something on the board. The next one is allergy management where a student is requested to clean yeah, and dust everything in the classroom. So I hope you now from this webinar you'll be able to identify your role as a teacher leader and teacher manager. Setting an example is not the main means of influencing others, it is the only means. So we need to imbibe the principle of the priority matrix which is introduced by Stephen Covey where it is, it, it is divided into four quadrants, do first. We need to prioritize what to do and accomplish. So this may refer to the instructional designs that we need to uh, do now because we are about to begin our class come August. The action, what to do next, the things that uh, we can do later, and those activities which uh, call for law of urgency. For example, uh, uh, we are watching movies now for now yeah that's crucial but since we are about to begin classes so why not concentrate on designing our instructional materials you know, come August so we need to prioritize so that we can we can thrive in this new learning environment so ba the bad news is time flies and the good news is you are the pilot so leadership according to Sancho uh, says that when one treats people with benevolence, justice, and righteousness and post confidence in them, the army will be united in mind and all will be happy to serve their leaders. So that's coming from Sancho. So I hope everyone will be able to get inspired from this training session where we can uh, faithfully demonstrate our role as a teacher and leader and empower our, ourselves to become effective leaders and managers by respecting, connecting, and collaborating others so that we can give the best tools and learning experiences for our students. So my dear teachers, if you have questions, please try to message me in my email, uh, aagordonas at pup.edu.ph. And for that, uh, maraming maraming salamat po and I'll see you soon. Thank you so much. God bless us all.